Tonight we're going to have a look at the subject, the deadly challenge of social media. I was asked to do two talks on technology. This is one of them. The other one was on technology itself. But we're just going to confine ourselves to this one talk and tomorrow night, God willing, we'll do something different. You know, when I was a child, about 10 or 11 years of age, we used to read comics. They're out of fashion nowadays. But there was one that was invented by a fellow called Chester Gould, an American, in 1946. He gave Dick Tracy, the subject of that comic, uh, a special wristwatch that acted as a two-way radio. Now, when I was a 10-year-old, that seemed like science fiction to me. But there would never come a time when that could possibly exist. Well, we are not only got it, we're beyond it in today's world with its technology. Unbelievable technology becomes a reality within the generation. When I read those comics and I saw this fellow speaking into his wristwatch as a two-way radio, I thought, nah, nah. Even as a 10-year-old, I thought, that's fanciful. Now everybody's got one much, much better in their hand. And here we are in 2019. But is the world a safer place? Is it a better place as a result? of that kind of technology? Is society producing a better connected, caring and compassionate community thereby? Well, I think you know the answer to that. The answer is a very real no. I want you to come, if you would, to Luke chapter 17, because here is a warning given by our Lord Jesus Christ that I think has some relationship to this subject this evening. Now, we know the context, don't we, of Luke 17 from about verse 26. We've got the days of Noah and the days of Lot. And we know what the Lord says about those days. Uh, and we're living in them. There's no question about that. We are in those days. When we come down to verse 30, he says this, Luke 17 and verse 30. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which is upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away, and he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Now we know that this has a dual application. It applied to those in the events of AD 70. It clearly applies to us, because we are living in those days of Noah and Lot, where we've got violence and immorality on every hand, and we've got, of course, the problem that Lot had to confront every day, in, in his face, it's more than in our face, isn't it, today, with the LGBT movement uh, and such like. We've got those days upon us. There's no question that Christ has in mind our time. So this has to have a relevance to us, and it does. So what did they use the housetop for in those times, brothers and sisters? Well, they used it for prayer and meditation. And an outside set of steps, you'd go up those steps when you came home from, from the work in the field, and you would prepare yourself to take upon yourself the obligations in the home downstairs. So you would pray and you would meditate. Now Christ is really telling us that he expects to find his people doing just that when he comes. But he drops a warning in. And the warning is about the stuff in the house. In the next verse, verse 32, you've just got a few words. Remember Lot's wife. In verse 33, he adds the principle that's operating here. And the principle is this, verse 33. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. In other words, if you want to preserve the things that belong to today, forget about tomorrow. If you're prepared to forsake some of the things of today that are not good for you, then you'll secure the future. That's the point he's making. And that applies, that principle applies in every single generation of those who ultimately will either find life or lose it. That's what we're confronted with today. Now, I can't really, in my best attempts, I can't really see in my mind's eye anyone when Christ sends the angels to collect us, to take us to the judgment seat, I can't see them putting their arms around the refrigerator and trying to marshal that out the front door. But I can see them grabbing for the something that they take with them every day, wherever they go, that might dominate their life. The gadgets. As you can see, that word stuff there is the Greek word skuos. I love it. You know, it's talking about skewing something in the, if you take it into the English, right? But it means in the Greek, implements, equipment, 
apparatus, and I love to add an additional word of my own, gadgets. I can see people grabbing for their gadget. Let me just give you a piece of advice. Three years ago, plus, we were in the Sinai Peninsula when there were ISIS rebels making life difficult for tourists, and there were virtually no tourists there except us idiots travelling around the Sinai Peninsula in danger. Don't worry about taking your iPhone or your smartphone to Mount Sinai. There is no reception there for phone, and there's no Wi-Fi, okay? You won't need it at the judgment seat of Christ. And I think Christ is actually telling us something. I think he's actually hinting, brothers and sisters, that one of the problems that would beset the latter-day brotherhood just before he came would be gadgetry. And we're going to examine that tonight. A little bit about technology and a lot about social media and the damage that it's doing to society and to us in this community of Christadelphians. <clears throat> There's no question that social media has changed the world in which we live. Go back to the beginning of what they call the Arab Spring. Late 2010 into 2011. And you'll know that that's true. Because it was the gadgetry in the hands of the people of those countries that marshalled the forces that got rid of Muammar Gaddafi of Libya, overthrew the government of Syria for a while, still going on that conflict. And many, many other countries were affected by that Arab Spring. And the world knows that it was social media that played a massive role in toppling many of those governments. Because, you see, people are in contact. You can actually get this gadget. You can actually take videos of what's happening. And someone 100 miles or 200 miles away can see exactly what's going on. You can marshal a crowd in minutes through this social media platform. Now, we've read Ecclesiastes chapter 7 tonight, and we're not going to do a detailed study, of course. We're just going to take a few passages from it to show that the relevance of the principles that come from that chapter to the things we're going to be speaking about. So what, so what can smartphones do? Well, Ecclesiastes 7.29, the last verse of that chapter, made this point. God made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. And I could have added some words on the back of that verse and say, God made man upright. Mankind has sought out many inventions that's made them crooked. It's made them crooked in many, in, in many ways, as we're going to see. So what can these phones do? Well, they're better than a two-way radio. They're a genuine two-way communication. They're a mini-mobile computer. You can access the internet without restriction, hence email, tweets, a plethora of other apps, as they call them, provide unlimited capacity for on-the-go communication. GPS maps and tracking of other people's mobile devices. Are a, it's a boon for concerned parents who want to know where their kids are. But it can also be a deadly weapon. I want to show you the raw side of social media and technology. This is the raw side. This is a house with a memorial outside of it because here, a father who had obviously big problems with his wife, she went to a shelter, he tracked her phone, he came there and he shot the f his five children and shot himself. So what some domestic violence shelters in the United States of America have learned from that experience is that as soon as victims arrive at shelters to, to find protection, they literally take their phones apart and they put them in a plastic bag so that the GPS stuff doesn't work anymore, so that people who want to track the wife and the, 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 the mother and the children haven't got that capacity. In Australia, we have a, a gentleman who, back in 2011, made these comments in a, in a country newspaper. The rather unusual name, Detective Idles of the Victorian Police. And he's, he made this comment, social media is killing us. And in the, in the paper, there was these little articles about some of the things that he was concerned with. The rise of social media has been slammed as a factor contributing to murders and suicides. Detective Senior Sergeant Rod Idles told Sunday's murder investigation forum at the Mildura Club, 
A lack of face-to-face communication had led to some people's feelings of isolation and loss of reality. And I don't think there's anybody who would argue with that. He wanted to say this. He urged people to step away from social media and actually start to speak to people instead of being selfish. The social fabric of our society has broken down. We have lost the art of communication. Communication now is either by Twitter, by Facebook, by text, by email. We have lost the art of sitting down and speaking to people. We wouldn't disagree with that, and that's eight years ago that he made those comments. You know, we've all seen people sitting in restaurants across the table from each other, supposedly having communication, and both of them are on their phone. Whether they were texting each other, I don't know. But you see them all the time. That's the way the world is today, isn't it? And it can be deadly, social media. I'm going to just give you a few instances of how deadly it is. This student, Phoebe Prince, hung herself as a 15-year-old because she was being abused both in the schoolyard and by cyberbullying. She endured three months of it and decided it was all too much and she took her life. We just read in Ecclesiastes 7, verses 25 and 26. I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. And I find, said the wise man, more bitter than death, the woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands as bands. Whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. You would want to escape from these two women. One in particular. This is about a love triangle. Love triangles often result in some seriously unfavourable results. Take, for instance, Tori Lynn Emery, 23, and Alicia Abernathy, 21. The two women fought over the same man via Facebook until a high-speed chase ended in murder. According to reports, Tori ran into Alicia at a McDonald's and was so worked up she followed her car and aggressively rammed her vehicle until Alicia was killed. As if the incident couldn't be any more, any more shocking, Tori did all of this while her three-year-old was in the back seat. Oh, and the man they were both pursuing was actually in prison. Now, how ridiculous is that? How true are the words of the wise men? In Ecclesiastes 7, verses 21 and 22, we read, Also, take no heed unto all words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee. For often times, said the wise man, and we know this to be true, oft times also thine own heart knoweth that thou thyself likewise has cursed others. Now, none of us would do that, would we? We'd never say nasty things about anybody. But you see, there was a time when you could say nasty things about someone to a person or a couple of people. Now you can say it to the world. Now you can put it on Facebook or on Twitter Just like Donald Trump does every day on Twitter, you can speak to the world. And they all know what's in your mind and what's coming off your tongue. All of them. That's the world we're living in. And it's costing lives. Another case. Here's a 14-year-old, Megan Taylor Mayer. She lived from 1992 to 2006. She too was bullied on the social networking website MySpace. (coughs) And it appears as though the mother of some of her schoolmates was actually behind this. And she ended up killing herself. It's dreadful, isn't it, when you think of what's happening. This is just a couple of cases of literally thousands that have happened in the last 10 years or so. What about this young fellow? The headline was, Teen Kills Dad After Being Banned From Using MySpace. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 9 said, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Well, this boy was very angry. When 15-year-old Huxton Schickler began posting his suicidal thoughts on MySpace, his parents decided that it would be best if his internet privileges were taken away. Yet, what they didn't know was that their son would literally kill to share his thoughts with the world. Schlicker stayed home from school during his MySpace punishment and waited for his dad to return home from work. Though he claims his initial plan was to take his own life, he shot his father as he walked through the door. 
Yeah, that's going on all the time. One more. This young lady set out on a journey. She didn't tell anybody else that she was going. She arranged this on Facebook. This trusting young Nigerian girl was viciously murdered while travelling from Abuja to Lagos without informing anyone about her mission. Literally hundreds of thousands of these cases of the misuse of social media. Abuse, and insult, rumour mongering, bullying, stalking, threats of harm, lewd and repulsive image attacks, revenge campaigns, etc, etc. That's what the world is doing with its social media. Now, none of us would be captive to this. We wouldn't be affected by this. Or are we? Well, we're going to test that. We're going to test that tonight, whether or not there is some impact upon our lives from social media. Well, let's go back to Detective Idle's comment about the lost art of communication. We have lost the art of sitting down and speaking to people, he said. As I said, we've all observed People sitting across from each other in restaurants or airports or whatever it may be, they're not talking, but they're all using their phones. That's, it's got them. It's got them in their grip, in its grip. But we ask this question, are not Facebook, Twitter, MySpace and many other social media platforms supposed to be all about communication? Yeah, well, so what's the problem? What's the problem here? We want to dig into that problem tonight, brothers and sisters, and just see what's going on. Now, this is a very recent article. This comes from the Brisbane Sunday Mail, the city in which I live, December 16th, 2018. It was under this heading, page 10, The Device Age. Game of violence as teens hit out, son threatens mother with a knife. I'm going to give you a few snippets from that article. Online gaming is turning teenage boys into violent thugs, forcing families to take out domestic violence orders against their sons. One Queensland father had to be hospitalised after his internet-addicted son punched him in the face for turning off an online game. Parents are afraid of their children, he told the Sunday Mail yesterday. Kids are literally assaulting their dads when they turn the game off at night. Some heavy gamers soiled themselves playing games, refused to go to school, suffered depression or had trouble concentrating. The introduction of smartphones and iPads over the past decade has coincided with a doubling in the cases of autism, while prescriptions to treat attention de de deficient hyperactivity disorder known as ADHD have grown by nearly one third. Australian occupational therapist Yvonne Wink yesterday said children were suffering separation anxiety because of a lack of face time with parents. And they were throwing tantrums to get parental attention. Miss Wink said devices were mushing children's brains and interfering with motor skills. They're so used to swiping, you know, we all got a gadget, you get a gadget, you've got a swipe to go through, okay? They're so used to swiping, they can't turn the pages of a book or hold a pencil. They get frustrated really easily. They don't have social problem-solving skills, and looking someone in the eye is becoming rare. Have you ever noticed that? People just don't look you in the eye anymore. They've lost that art. There's something gone. They go on. Queensland Brain Institute researcher Dr James Kesby said, Many online games triggered hits of dopamine. We want to talk about dopamine. They're copying casinos and gambling games, he said. Dopamine, this article said, is the key to keep players wanting to get that reward again and again. Now, let me ask you a question, brothers and sisters. Most of us use email. Probably some of us use social media. We might be on Facebook, for example. When you send a message to someone by any one of those mechanisms, be honest with yourself. Do you have an expectation of a response? Are you looking for a response? Usually. Yeah, because you see, dopamine is at work. You've all heard of dopamine, haven't you? In fact, it plays a much bigger part in our life than what we are aware of. 
So what is it? Well, this article went on to talk about a few things, like this one here on the frontal lobe. One study claimed frequent players, that is, video game players, can get video game brain. This means key parts of their frontal lobe become uh, underused, which can alter moods. They talk about the, the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. Doesn't mean much to me. Immediately, they say, after firing a weapon in a game, players show more activity in this area, which controls cognition and planning. So, you know, here they are shooting people on their game, whatever they do, and that's actually changing their brain, physically changing their brain. They talk about dopamine, which is involved in learning and feelings of reward. So let's have a bit of a, a better definition of what dopamine does. Dopamine plays a major role in the brain system that is responsible for reward-driven learning. Every type of reward that has been studied increases the level of dopamine transmission in the brain. And a variety of highly addictive drugs, including stimulants such as cocaine and methamphetamine, act directly on the dopamine system. There is evidence that people with extroverted, that is, reward-seeking personality types, tend to show higher levels of dopamine activity than people with introverted personalities. So this is the way it works. When you, for example, look up something that gives some pleasure to the flesh, dopamine, the chemical of the brain, starts to do its job. And the more you get involved in that, the more you want to be involved in that, the more reward-seeking there is. And eventually you become addicted. And it's no different addiction, really, than addiction to nicotine or addiction to alcohol. It's an addiction. It's got you under control. And so you act actually have to do something very serious to overcome the problem. Now, I've been through a little bit of that. I'm going to be honest with you. I've been through a bit of that, and most of us have. Some of the older folk who don't use gadgets, maybe not. But those of us who use gadgets, I don't think you would be perfectly honest with me if you said that it doesn't affect you in some way. We're all affected by it. And that's why Christ warned about it. He saw what it could do. He saw down the corridor of time to our time. He knew that we would have to face this. And we are facing it. He knew it would be a problem. And I know many lives that have been destroyed by modern technology and especially, especially by access to the internet. Many, many lives. And I could tell you some horrifying stories that I've come across as I travel around. And the, and the fallout, the collateral damage, that you might say, of that is still reverberating in far too many lives. I want to turn then to one of the addictive social media platforms of our time. It's called Facebook. I don't use Facebook, and you're going to find out why. I never have, and I never will. Don't send me anything on Facebook, because I will not get it, and I certainly, if I did, wouldn't respond to it. You're going to see why. Facebook is the most prominent social media service in the world today. It now has billions of users around the world. And Time magazine recognised the dangers of Facebook way back in 2010. I wonder if any of you saw that particular Time magazine. Well, you're going to find out what it said tonight. It devoted its final issue in 2010 to Facebook and its founder, who was chosen that year as the person of the year. Now, that person, of course, was Mark Zuckerberg. In 2018, he was a busy man. He's still a busy man. He's appearing in Congress and before committees. He went to Europe before their parliament. He's been all over because, you see, people are saying, what on earth is Facebook doing with the information that it's collecting? And it's not doing great things. Okay, So he's in trouble. His organisation has to pull its socks up because there's serious issues that the world understands because of the lack of control of the information that's been collected. So he's been all over the place. The world now knows that time was right in 2010. So here was their article. P 
person of the year, there he is on the front cover. Young man, he's now, of course, a multi-billionaire, probably got $10, $12 billion. He was made person of the year. But they, they said this about person of the year. Person of the year is not and never has been an honour. It is a recognition of the power of individuals to shape our world. And this man certainly has. For connecting more than half a billion people, which was the number of, of subscribers they had in, in 2010, and mapping the social relations among them, something that has never been done before, for changing how we all live our lives in ways that are innovative and even optimistic. Yeah, they understood eight or nine years ago the effect that Facebook was having on human society. You know, some of you may be on Facebook. I'm not going to ask you the embarrassing question, how many friends you've got. The average number of friends in 2010 was 150. In 2010, you could use 75 different languages so that you can type in English to someone in China and they read it in Chinese, in Mandarin. All right? You can type in French. Someone in France reads it in French. I mean, how good is that? You don't have to bother learning a language. You just type in your own language. And it does all the work for you. But how good are Facebook friends? A brother approached me just a couple of weeks ago when I gave a similar talk. And he said, you know, I actually created for the, for the Ecclesia a Facebook page recently. And within days, and within a couple of days, I had 15 requests to be friends. All right? From Christadelphians. 15 requests to go on their page as friends. Well, time recognised the fallacy of Facebook friends. Facebook herds everybody, friends, co-workers, romantic partners, that guy who lived on your block but moved away after fifth grade, into the same big room. I love this phrase. It smooshes together your work self and your home self, your past self, and your present self into a single generic extruded product. Sounds like making sausages to me. It suspends the natural process by which old friends fall away over time, allowing them to build up endlessly, producing the social equivalent of liver failure. On Facebook, there is one kind of relationship, friendship, and you have it with everybody. You're friends with your spouse and with your plumber. Look, this is not my words. I could tell you this and you'd say, oh, that's just an exaggeration. No, this is what Time said eight years ago. They got it right, brothers and sisters. Sometimes the world shows a little bit of wisdom. They got this right. So what is the core of the problem? Well, it's really addiction. It's internet addiction. So let's get a definition of addiction, shall we? So there's two definitions here, two, two ways that you can have an addiction. It's a state of physiological, so physiological's got to do with the function of organisms. Or psychological, that's mental, it's got to do with the mind. Physiological or psychological dependence on a substance especially an illegal drug or one liable to have a, 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 a damaging effect. It could also be great interest in something to which a lot of time is devoted. And that's where I think Facebook comes in. So how can social media completely take over someone's life? Well, because of addiction. There is that brain reward chemical called dopamine that plays a huge role in building internet addiction. Now, there are various forms of addiction when it comes to social media. Time pointed out, way back in 2010, about this matter of the addiction of disclosure. They said, but there's another danger, which is that instead of feeling forced to share, we won't be able to stop ourselves from sharing that we will willingly, compulsively violate our own privacy. Relationships on Facebook have a seductive, addictive quality 
that can erode and even replace real-world relationships. Have you ever heard any marriages that have been broken up by people on the internet using social media? I've heard of a lot of them. Yeah. Because, you see, it's an unreal world, but it seems, it seems better than the real world that you're in. So you branch off into an unreal world. It is happening in our community. Yeah. And I can reel off the cases. Friendships multiply with gratifying speed. And the emotional stakes stay soothingly low. Where there isn't much privacy, there can't be much intimacy either. It's like an emotional Ponzi scheme where you keep putting energy in and getting it back tenfold, even though the dividends start to feel a little fake. That's the unreal world into which some people have got themselves. Here's one case. This woman. An article published earlier this year in European Psychiatry presented the case of a woman who lost her job to a Facebook addiction. And the author suggested it could become a diagnosable ailment. Well, since then, it has become a diagnosable ailment. You can go to a GP and he will say you have got a Facebook addiction. It's a disease. And you can go and have a Facebook intervention now. It costs you money, but you can have a Facebook intervention to overcome this problem. The woman in question couldn't even make it through an ex examination without checking Facebook on her phone. And you don't check your phone when you're doing an examination because they think you're cheating. All right, so she lost her job. What about the threat to marriages that I've mentioned briefly? Time said this. According to the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers, 81% of its members have seen a rise in the number of divorce cases involving social networking. 66% cite Facebook as the primary source for online divorce evidence. This woman said in 2011, ever flirted with someone other than your spouse in a Facebook chat? It happens in our community. You know that? You had better hope your message records don't end up in the hands of a divorce lawyer because they can access even the ones you've deleted. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. So what are Facebook threats to the truth, brothers and sisters? They're many. Currently, Facebook is used by Christadelphians to publicise their reasons for voting in political, ele political elections, clearly designed to influence others to do the same. And we have them. In our country, where I come from, people who openly publicise that they go and vote in political elections. It's being used to push women's rights issues with a view to achieving equality for sisters in the leadership of the Brotherhood. It's being used extensively to publish wrong doctrine. We have an unbelievable push in Australia of theistic evolution, or GDE as they prefer to call it, God-directed evolution. All right? And I can tell you stories that would make your hair stand up about that. And Facebook and other social media is their primary platform for pushing their wrong doctrines. And also diverse prophetic interpretations that are far removed from our pioneering interpretations of Bible prophecy. It's being used to confuse the world about what the Christadelphian community actually stands for. And sadly, I'm reluctant to say it, brothers and sisters, but I know it, I've seen it with my own eyes. It's being used to connect homosexuals in the Christadelphian community. You may be aware there is such a thing as a Christadelphian homosexual website. When I looked it up, I got straight in. When I went the second time, a year or two later, to check it out again, you have to have a code to get in. Okay? But it's there. I saw it with my own eyes. So that's the sort of thing that's being used. Facebook and other platforms are being used to promote. This is one of Facebook's databases. One of the things I enjoy doing driving through crumbling American towns is to see what used to be probably big businesses, huge buildings, vacant. No cars parked around them, gates locked. 
Facebook goes out looking for buildings like that because they need more and more to put their databases. This is their databases. They pack those old factories full of databases like that. You know why they've got to do that? Because they never delete anything. Never, ever delete anything. It's all stored. It's going to have to wait to Armageddon to destroy it. Time said this. Facebook has a richer, more intimate hoard of information about its citizens than any nation has ever had. And the US government sometimes comes knocking, subpoena in hand, looking to borrow some. That has implications for Christadelphians. We want to talk a bit about that. So what does Facebook do with all this stored data? Ecclesiastes 7 verse 11 said this. Wisdom is good with an inheritance. But my words are, but not if the inheritance is a Facebook record that is never erased. Because sometimes that doesn't show forth wisdom. Many of the most popular applications or apps on the social networking site Facebook Inc. have been transmitting identifying information, in effect providing access to people's names and in some cases their friends' names to dozens of advertising and internet tracking companies. That's why Mark Zuckerberg's been called before Congress. That's why he's, he's being called to Europe to answer as to why this is happening. Well, it's happening because of money. This is how they make their money. They find out what you look up on the internet, they find out what you say in Facebook, all that goes into, into a database, and it comes out the other end, churns out the other end and says, Fred Bloggs enjoys this, this, this and that. All of a sudden, Fred Bloggs, when he goes on the internet, <coughs> up comes all this stuff that they think Fred Bloggs is interested in. They know exactly what you've been doing when you've been looking up internet sites. This is what they know about you. Companies like Google, Yahoo, Microsoft gather information by tracking your web surfing activity through small computer files, they call them cookies, or software programs installed on your computer by the websites you visit. Over time, this information says a lot about your interests. Companies then use the information to make other guesses and predictions about you, ranging from gender and age to marital status and creditworthiness. It's rarely a coincidence when you see web ads for products that match your interests. Every time I get into YouTube, for example, up she comes. You might be interested in this and that and this and that. Really? How did you find that out? Well, because they're tracking you. As is Facebook. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 8 says, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. My comment is, but not with Facebook. Because it doesn't have an end. It's stored permanently. So here's some of the Facebook data that's never deleted. Every friend request you've ever received and how you responded. Every poke, they call it a nudge. Every poke or nudge you've exchanged. Every event you've been invited to through Facebook and how you responded. The IP address used each and every time you've logged into Facebook. Dates of username changes and historical privacy settings that you've changed. Camera metadata, including timestamps and latitude, longitude of picture location. So they've even, they even even know where you've gone on holidays. And what you've been taking photographs of. And they even know how high you are in the air. Yeah. They've got this idea. You know, look, you put a photograph on there, they can tell you what elevation was taken out of a plane window or from the top of a mountain. They know how high you are up in the air. Credit information. If you've ever purchased credits or advertising on Facebook. Your last known physical location with latitude, longitude, time, date, altitude and more. The report notes that they are unsure how Facebook collects this data, but they do. Looking for a job. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 1 said, A good name is better than precious ointment. Maybe not with a Facebook record. 
Many employees, employers I should say, now routinely check the Facebook page of job applicants. By so doing, they can ascertain what your real interests in life are, what kind of friends you keep, what type of personality you are, your ambitions in life, indications of attitude and character all comes through the Facebook record. If you don't hear from a pr prospective employer, there's every possibility that your Facebook details have had some input. You need to think about that. What about if your country went to war? Let's just say Donald Trump declared war on Mexico. Because they won't pay for the war. So what if your country went to war? It won't. Before Christ comes, I believe. I wish it would. It would be the best thing that happened to young Christadelphians ever. Because they would have to go through what I went through as a 20-year-old. Called up to, to fight in Vietnam. Had to go to court and stand before the authorities of the land. Give testimony to my convictions and beliefs. Yeah, best thing that ever happened to you. Now, they would call up not just men, males. In the next war, they'll call up females. You got it. I mean, if you're going to pay the woman tennis player who wins a Grand Slam the same as the man who wins the Grand Slam, yeah, they go, you've got to treat them equally. And you know, of course, that there are many women in the, in the American army right now. They're signing up left, right and centre. You would seek exemption from military service, non-combatant and combatant service. The court case would require you to defend what you have said and done in the past against your claims of being a conscientious objector. I had some good friends who went through court alongside of me. And they got thrashed. In one case, a good friend of mine, his father wasn't in the truth. Things happened in his house that didn't happen in mine. They asked him questions about that. Thrashed him for eight hours. And that was without any recourse to anything on the internet. Didn't exist in those days. That was 1969. Didn't exist. But it does now. And there's a full record out there if you're on Facebook or any other social media platform. Crown prosecutors would carefully examine social media data for clues to inconsistency. And they're looking for them, I can tell you. Think about that. Time warns of distortion. We are running our social lives, they said, over the internet. An infrastructure that was not designed for that purpose. And we must be aware of the distortions it creates, or we will be distorted by them. I think that's very, very wise counsel. I don't often say that the, the world gets wisdom like that, but that is wise counsel. So what about some strategies? You personally may not, in fact, need a Facebook intervention. Perhaps just a reality check. Be aware of the time spent using social media and ask yourself this question honestly. Are you doing as much Bible reading and study now as you were before you got your gadgets? Ask yourself that question. Ask this question. If you are deeply into social media, is this really what I want to be doing with my time? Ask honestly whether social media has displaced Bible reading and study in your life. And brothers and sisters, never ignore your conscience. It's the God-given ability to deal with problems that enter our life. Conscience can only come from the Word of God, can only be developed and maintained from the Word of God. So constant daily reading and study is the means of building up a good, sensitive, moral compass, a conscience. Never, ever ignore it, like I do sometimes. And you are my companions, are you not? We do ignore our conscience sometimes. Limit friends to those who are genuinely so. Not the flip-floppy friends that time talked about. 
Take breaks from using Facebook and tell your friends you're going to be offline for two weeks. You know why that's important? Because you can actually test whether you've got an addiction. Because you won't last for two weeks if you've got an addiction. You won't last a day. So you can actually test whether or not it is an addiction. And if it is an addiction, it's just as serious as any other addiction that people have. Because it might cost you eternal life. And that's serious. Strategies for parents. We ask the question, is the greatest enemy of modern parents' technology in the hands of our children? Well, I think it actually is. Make sure you have effective controls on the devices your children use. Internet filtering, for example, absolutely essential. There have been some terrible cases in this country among my good friends who I've visited very often where their children have had open access to the internet. And they're not with us today. They're gone. I personally don't trust my flesh. I know if I give it half an inch, it will take 10 miles. That's the way my flesh operates. Now, you may be different. If you are, please tell me your secret. On my laptop, on my phone, and any other gadget that can access the internet, I have filtering devices which are connected to, when I go onto the internet, that's the first thing that they connect to. I cannot access dubious sites. And you know who's got the password to change the settings, which frustrates me no end? because sometimes I can't get in when I, sh I know I should get in. I'm not going to do anything awful. I just want to get in and do my emails, and I can't do that when I'm sitting in the McDonald's. You know who's got the password? My lovely wife at home. And I'm not going to be calling her and saying, Dear, can you tell me the password? I don't trust my nature. You haven't got something like that in your children. If you happen to have children or grandchildren, you don't have something like that on their devices. I would suggest you haven't thought hard enough about the consequences. 70% of internet traffic, including all business traffic, 70%. Seven, zero. Is that clear? Not 17 Seven zero percent of internet traffic is pornography. That's the fact. It has taken over modern civilization, and millions, if not billions, of lives are being destroyed by it. Marriages are being destroyed by it. Another strategy. Talk to your children over the meal table and the readings about the issues and challenges that they face. Because there's many that us older folk don't understand. We have no idea what's going on in their world. Talk to them about those issues and build a relationship of trust with them. Teach your children, above all, the principles of the truth. It's the only antidote in the end. Here are a couple of passages to ponder. I say this quite often to young people's groups. We are the most sorely tested people, especially our young people, the most sorely tested generation in human history. No generation before us has had the gadgetry, the access to the world that we have got today. You've got it in the palm of your hand, 24 hours a day. And this is what we read. Paul, who was stoned at Lystra, rose up, confirmed the souls of the disciples and exhorted them to continue in the faith that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Well, we don't suffer his tribulation. Nobody's going to stone us, are they? But we're actually more tested than those who were stoned. Revelation 7 verse 14. 
These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The word tribulation in both of those verses is the Greek word flipsis. It simply means pressure. Through much pressure. And here we are, brothers and sisters, Revelation 7.14. These are they which came out of great pressure. And that pressure has caused something that's required them to seek forgiveness. See what it says? And have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So let's go back to where we started. In that day he which shall be upon the housetop for prayer and meditation and his gadgets in the house, let him not come down to take it away. Leave it at home. You won't need it at the judgment seat of Christ. I want you to come, if you would, finally to Isaiah chapter 26. Now, there hasn't been a great deal of exposition here tonight because really this is a huge subject. We've let others do the talking. But let's just briefly look at a couple of passages that are very useful to us here in the very last days of Gentile darkness. Isaiah chapter 26. Now we know that verse 19 of Isaiah 26 is all about the resurrection of the dead. <clears throat> in verse 19 we read this, and I'm going to read it to you as it is in the literal Hebrew. Thy dead shall live, as my dead body shall they arise. Now, you might want to make some changes in your Bible if you haven't done that. This is, as it were, Messiah speaking. Thy dead shall live. It's Yahweh looking down at Messiah. Thy dead, my son, shall live. Then, it's as though Christ says, as my dead body, they shall arise. And they will, those that are in him. Awake and sing, he that dwell in dust, for thy dew is the dew of not herbs, but lights just like the dew on the ground in the morning when the sun shines upon it. And the earth shall cast out the dead. So there's the resurrection. And then we come to the bridal chamber in verse 20. Come, my people, enter, in, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. Some of you will be aware that the Hebrew word rendered a little moment there is the word riga, R-E-G-A. It means... In the wink of an eye. It's taken up by the Apostle in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 52 when he says, We shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Yeah, so resurrection, one year of the judgment seat. We know from Exodus chapter 40 that the judgment seat will last for one year. Okay, which is a good thing, isn't it? One year. Then there's a second year. That second year is the subject of Deuteronomy 24, verse 5. Now, turn it up if you like, but you know the passage. The first four verses of Deuteronomy 24 are about flippancy of a husband in marriage. He puts away his wife. There's a scenario created and a law given. Being so flippant, he's not allowed to take her back again. Then the next verse is about Christ. When a man takes a wife, he shall not be charged with any business, he shall not go to war. He shall spend 12 months cheering up his wife. Anybody in this hall, brethren, who spent the first 12 months of your married life, didn't go to work, you weren't charged with any business, you didn't do any shopping, didn't do anything, except cheer up your wife. Anybody? Of course not. Not even Damien. Nobody ever did. Not even the wise man Solomon ever did that. Because it wasn't designed for ordinary men. It was designed for one man who will. And his name is Jesus Christ. He will spend, as soon as he has immortalised the saints that are worthy and dismissed those who are unworthy, he will spend the next 12 months. Zero preparation for Armageddon. None of that. 12 months going around meeting every single individual member of his bride. And he'll want to know a bit more about you. He knows quite a bit. He knows a lot about you, actually. He's going to get to know you a lot better, personally, face to face. And that will take him 12 months to get around the multitude 
of the glorified saints. And then there's a four and a half year period of preparation where the angels hand over their work to the saints. And there's a lot of work in front of them the next 45 years. Then there's a three and a half ministry of Elijah and many of the saints who go out in relation to the Jews outside the land. And then, of course, there are things that happened before Armageddon. There's the subjugation of the Sinaitic Arabs for a good purpose and the beginning of the smiting and healing of Egypt of Isaiah 19. All of that before Armageddon. Okay. So what do you reckon the world's doing in this time? Well, we're locked away. Well, we know what we're going to do. We've got the time of trouble of Daniel chapter 12. And it's referred to here in Isaiah 26. So I want you to read with me what we didn't read of verse 20. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. Now, is that Armageddon? No. You know why it's not? Because the next verse is Armageddon. Verse 21. For behold, Yahweh cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth. That's Armageddon. And the Yahweh here is Christ and the saints leaving Sinai and making their way up to the Mount of Olives. So what's the indignation then? Well, they're in the bridal chamber. The time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation on earth. And that's saying something. Because Michael will have come to raise the dead, to determine destinies. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the Mike Kael, the one who was like Ale, and the judgment seat will sort out the worthy from the unworthy. The resurrection era, of course, is the period when the time of trouble begins. That's why you've got that phrase in Daniel 12, verses 1 and 2. And at that time. And at that time. What time? The resurrection of the dead. And those that are in the book of life are given life. So the time of trouble starts when we're removed. And we're going to be removed on the eve of the Great Depression that's coming. And the world knows it's coming. And you know when they're saying it's going to come? 2019. And if not 2019, 2020. And it will be late if it comes in 2020, which is why Trump will get elected again. I'll make a prophecy. Had a vote today, he would be kicked out of office. But if the Great Depression comes, nobody's going to vote for a Democrat. So I'll make a prediction. But it won't matter. Because if there is a depression, we're not going to be here to worry about it. We'll be at the judgment seat of Christ. And our destinies will be determined. So what do you reckon the world's going to do? Well, that's happening. What part might social media play, brothers and sisters, do you think? I think it's going to play a huge part. Bear in mind that social media, the internet, Facebook's data storage is going to last until the great earthquake destroys it. That's 10 years away if Christ comes today. So what do you reckon they're going to do when they finally realise that their Christadelphian neighbours are no longer there and their Christadelphian workers are not turning up to work and their Christadelphian children are not turning up to school or college. What do you reckon they're going to do? Well, I reckon they're going to use social media. They know more about us than you imagine. And they can look it up on the internet. And if we're gone and we're all gone, then they're going to find out that we are the people who most likely will become immortal in our absence from them. Look at this. This is a recent advertisement for a movie. The movie was called Altered Carbon. I don't know what it was about and I don't care. What I do care about is what they say. This is what they say in the advertisement. When your rulers live forever, you have no choice but to join the resistance. Yeah, and I think social media is going to play a huge part 
It won't play a part at the end of the millennium when there will be another huge rebellion and they'll try and throw off their immortal rulers. But I believe it will play a big part when we're gone. Can you imagine the messages that are going around? You know that fella? What was his name? Stan, was it? Stan something. Okay. He's he not there anymore. Yeah. Right all over the world. The world has created a monster. What will they do when God unleashes it upon themselves? We'll have to wait and see. The angels will tell us. Social media, technology has its uses, brothers and sisters, but it can be a deadly enemy if it is not used wisely. God willing, tomorrow night we're going to talk about a different subject. We're going to talk about the last, the very final challenge, I believe, to latter-day Christadelphians. Post-modernism. The outgrowth of humanism. The last door, the end door. The final challenge. Post-modernism. You know what? It's already working its work in our community. We'll talk about that tomorrow night, God willing.